and welcome. I'd like to thank, uh, begin by thanking some of my colleagues for their support of this webinar series. A special thank you to Clara Davison and her team in the Office of Advancement in the College of Arts and Sciences for facilitating these webinar events. I'd also like to thank Alison Kaboski at the Barnett Center for her kind and gener generous spirit as she works with me behind the scenes to facilitate this webinar series. Creative Pathfinders was envisioned as a way to strengthen our connection with our alumni network in the arts and design as we celebrate the unique contributions of our alumni within their respective fields. And perhaps now more than ever to remember why we need the arts. I wanted to make a space through Creative Pathfinders where we can turn towards each other and take some time to marvel at the courageous and singular career paths of each of the alumni that will join us in this series. As I introduce our panelists this afternoon, you will find their bios in the chat box within your Zoom window. We are joined today by two very distinguished alumna from the Department of Dance. Diane McIntyre earned her BFA in dance in 1969. A recent Guggenheim Fellow and a 2016 Doris Duke artist, Diane choreographs for concert dance, theater, opera, and film. Her amazing body of work expands almost 50 years, and she is current, also currently the co-director of Jacob's Pillow, Ann and Weston Hicks choreogra Choreography Fellows Program with Risa Steinberg. Abby Zibakowski uh, received her MFA in dance in 2012. She is the founder and artistic director of Abby Z and the New Utility and assistant professor of dance at the University of Illinois on, on the faculty at the American Dance Fa Festival. Among their many accomplishments, both Diane and Abby were also awarded the 2020 United States Artist Fellowship. They will be joined in conversation this afternoon by Dr. Nadine George Graves. Nadine is chair and professor of the Department of Dance and also professor in our Department of Theater. George Graves is situated, uh, her work is situated at the intersections of African American studies, critical gender studies, performance studies, theater history, and dance history. George Graves is also an artist and her creative work is part and parcel of her research. She is an adept, adapter, director, and dance theater maker. Nadine joined Ohio State after teaching for over 20 years at the University of California, San Diego and Yale. There will be time towards the end of the hour for questions from our audience, and we do encourage your questions. So please submit them within the Q&A function as they arise. I am super excited for this conversation, so I'll hand it over to Abby now as she gives us a brief overview of her creative work in the world. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Allison, for the intro. I always forget that um, I have to update my bio. I am an associate professor now at the University of Illinois. Um, and if you've received tenure or our tenure track, you know exactly how much work goes into that process. So I kind of wear that badge proudly. Um, I'm Abby Zbikowski, as Allison said. Um, I am a choreographer. <laughs> I'm a teaching artist. I am not in my work, but I am a part of my work and my work is really rooted in practice and process. Um, I kind of put forth the, the ethos of practice and, and that kind of terminology over my work is process-based because oftentimes saying that dance work is process-based puts it in a particular world or genre and um, I'm interested in kind of debunking or blasting or showing kind of poking holes or seeing the holes that are already poked in these like divisions that are created and that exist a lot in in the west in America and that are very kind of culturally conditioned into us. Um, we're not showing video. We were said we were told we weren't allowed to, to show video because it's choppy on Zoom. Um, so 
the best way I think for you all to understand my work is to understand me and my operating system um, and kind of the cultural conditions that have shaped my point of view as a, as a maker and as a human, which are, are intrinsically linked and um, something that I emphasize as I work with collaborators is that you know, you're not just a dancer here and then a person there, but really calling upon, you know, this arsenal of lived experiences um, in order to create something that represents, you know, who we are right now, 21st century contemporary dance. Um, so I'm going to highlight some life experiences that go beyond a bio, um, because I think that these anecdotes will almost set the stage for understanding a bit more about me. Um, so I grew up in South Jersey, pretty, you know, fluctuated between middle class and working class because I was in like, you know, a family where my father was often either working as a insurance salesman or at golf caddy, depending on, you know, when he was laid off, which was often. Um, I grew up loving dance, 100% Polish was around a lot of polka dancing. So dance and movement wasn't something that was foreign to us. Um, but uh, I also grew up during the time of like the height of MTV and wanting to, to, to dance for Janet Jackson and that being the pinnacle of sort of artistry in my mind. It's something that I actually still hold in extreme high regard um, and is influential on, on like my relating to dancers of younger generations that that understand like that there is artistry in commercial dance and that nothing is just this one thing that is being painted as a picture so all that being said my, my true love was also tap dancing so I was a tapper and uh I was really lucky I was exposed uh, to you know hoofing and um it wasn't so much about sort of this aesthetic of of like presenting tapping, but it was this sensation of doing tapping and rhythm and, you know, um, understanding or, or really experiencing the healing qualities and the healing power of that like sensation of rhythm. Um, Cause I grew up in a very turbulent household. Uh, as soon as I could, I, I would hop the train over to Philly and I was of a generation where hip hop was just starting to make its way into dance studios. And uh, in Philadelphia, we had Rennie Harris Pure Movement. So I was taking classes and workshops from, from dancers who are still mentors and friends. Raphael Xavier, who actually is doing the music for my latest work, would take Crystal Frazier's class. Um, so, so all that is that my point of view or my point of departure for dance is a little different than maybe what people at the time, like now it's, a, it's more common for a white working class or a white woman to, you know, uh, be operating from a point of really understanding the African American and Africanist influence on dance and aesthetics in this country. Um, I went to Temple University for undergrad and, you know, when I was there, we didn't have to take ballet. We had to take Mufundula technique, which was a Pan-African, what is a Pan-African modern dance technique. So, so, you know, all of that combined, plus uh, right after undergrad, I was dancing for Charles Anderson, who he's the, the chair at UT Austin. Um, he, he brought in a collaborator for a project, um, uh, a collaborator for a project. Uh, and, sorry, I just got an alert at what time we are. Uh, a collaborator for project, Vincent Manso. He's a South African choreographer. And um, he really kind of open the door or to to a whole other world of contemporary dance that was being created by African choreographers. And so there was different lineages and different histories and sort of different um, innovations and experimentations happening in the body that were really pivotal for me in, in creating the works that I make. So the works that I make in essence, like they, they prioritize necessity. They're, they're out of necessity. Like, um, I have always had to dance. I've always had to be physical. I've worked from a young age. Um, I started working at a bowling alley in the seventh grade. And so this is an anecdote that I think says a lot about my work. 
that I would work Saturdays and Sundays and I would open the bowling alley and I would have to, um, along with another porter, because we were like at the, the bottom of the, the totem pole, um, we would have to um, put back all of the bowling balls that were out from the night before. So in order to effectively do that and get all the other work we needed to get done, we would throw these like 20 pound bowling balls to each other, just like chucking them across the, um, the, <laughs> this like open space so we could get things done. And um, there was something about the rhythm. There was something about the dance that I like I, I had in my body, this kind of kinesthetic body knowledge that helped me organize. And there's something about that action where it's like, yeah, it's high stakes. You have to be alert. You have to figure out a system in order to get it done efficiently and effectively. And um, how can you actually get some joy out of it and express yourself while doing it? So, so that anecdote, I think, lends itself to, to viewing my work in a particular way, which is um, like there's an urgency. There's like not hiding or not, not shying away from being tired or not shying away from actually putting what your body has to offer. Because I'm not saying that the body, I, I'm really talking about how the, the body and the mind are not separate things. So looking at the self holistically and putting that on the line and re-envisioning and reinventing and innovating in ways that allows us to, to move forward and also kind of reconsider some of these um, categories or delineations that have maybe made us think that we're one thing and overlooked other aspects of um, what makes us who we are. So um, I have a couple, uh, here we go, a little bit of a slideshow to show you all. Um, so these are some, some process photos. This is at New York Live Arts. This was all leading up to radioactive practice, which was supposed to premiere uh, last year, but is on hold because of COVID. But it has been a three year process of working tightly with these collaborators and the collaborators have shifted over time because there is a um, there's a demand in this work there's a demand that you be present physically, mentally, emotionally, and I honor that and I've come to really understand it's not for everyone. And that part of the work is understanding, you know how to create a sustainable life inside of what it is we're trying to do with dance. So um, kind of honoring that, you know, for the most part, it's the same people. There's one or two people that, you know, had to move or are currently not living in New York City because of COVID. Um, these photos right here, and all these photos are by Effie Falk, who actually went to OSU. He's a, he's a veterinary in tech now, but um, these stage shots were the last sort of residuals from what was, we got shut down going into production week last year at New York Live Arts. Um, so this was the last thing we did before we closed up shop and began working on Zoom. Um, my collaborators come from all different movement backgrounds, um, but the research doesn't stop at oh, well, my body knows how to do this and my body knows how to do that. And let's just kind of quote this movement vocabulary and that, but it's understanding more specifically, like what is the psychology that, what is the, like, what's the practice involved of being able to do certain skills? What are these kind of psychological states that we're in, involved in? How can we create space in order to achieve things that we didn't know we were capable of doing? So going back to you know, the, the, the name of my company, the new utility, it is about functionality. And the, also as a result of these like differing um, spaces that I've existed in as a choreographer, as a, as a dance student, um, a, as a dance student, I have, uh, <laughs> I got another warning. I'm wrapping up now. Um, it's really important for my work to hold space to bring a lot of people together to kind of, yes, they're going to inflect and understand um, dance, what they're seeing from their own perspective, but also kind of giving them entryways to reconsider, um, kind of turning it on its head and, and reconsider sort of um, other 
kind of other ways they might see the world or consider similarities or differences. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up right now. Thank you. And turning it over to Ms. Diane McIntyre. Thank you, Abby. So hello, everyone. I'm Diane McIntyre. I'm uh, here with you from Cleveland, Ohio. And first, I want to say that I am a big fan of Abby's work. I saw it first at Ohio State University, and then I got to see a rehearsal of hers not long ago at American Dance Festival. And she gets to every detail. She tells the people exactly, she keeps working with them until they do exactly what she has in mind. I was extremely inspired by her rehearsal. <laughs> what an artist. So I'll tell you a little bit about my dance journey. I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio. When I was a child, I studied with Elaine Gibbs Redman. My father, Benny McIntyre, and mother, Dorothy McIntyre, put me into her dance school when we were, and my sister Donna went there too when we were children. And then I also studied simultaneously with Virginia Driansky. She was a modern dancer, which was very rare for a young person to get modern dance training at a young age. With Virginia, we also did uh, activist dances. When I was eight years old, we were doing um, uh, dances to Odetta. Before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. Go home to my Lord and be free. Yes, yes. So that came into my consciousness very early. Also, when I was in high school, I had a phys ed teacher whose name was Charlotte Honda. Miss Honda was actually a dancer. In those days, they didn't have that separation. If you wanted to do physical uh, work, physical training with your students, you had to be in the physical education department. However, she was a beautiful dancer. I'm like, whoo, how did she get that background? I found out she had gone to Ohio State University. So I said, I want to be there. So I enrolled at Ohio State University, of course, with my parents' uh, support. And I became a dance major there. I would like to say my main mentors there were Helen Alkire, the chair of the department and founder of the department. Vera Blaine, who had had her training at OSU and also later became the um, chair of the department, and Lucy Venable, who was the head of the Dance Notation Bureau Extension at the Ohio State University Dance Department. They were my mentors and they kept up with me and I kept up with them throughout the years. So at OSU, we had the classics in terms of our training, the particular modern dance training was all in classics. We had production, we had everything. We had guest artists, we had dance history. In dance history, I had the experience that not only the history of Western civilization, but the dance of peoples of other cultures the people of Asia and Africa. And when I found that the people in those cultures, that their dance was vital, it was vital. Without the dance, their communities would not survive in the same way. When I found out the dance could have that power, I said, I want my dance to be vital like that. Also from Ohio State, it was instilled to me that I could do anything really in this particular field. I got that type of nourishment and confidence from being there. Okay, now we also had amazing guest artists. They tried to bring in the most current people who were doing edgy type of choreography and I received a lot from that too. I taught for one year at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. There, I met a man named Cheston Everett. His brother is Milana Karanga, who founded Kwanzaa. So from Cheston Everett, I got the experience that our art as people, as Black people, our art must always be infused or 
inspired by or catapulted by black consciousness. He said we had no choice. Of course, this was the black consciousness era. Not that our whole era has not been that through the period uh, back in the 1600s all the way through. This particular period was highlighted through many poets, artists, and we come around to that again today. So I went to New York City after I was at, in Milwaukee, mostly to study. However, when I was there, I became totally absorbed in two areas. One, I danced with Gus Solomons Jr., his dance company, and I also became very, very inspired by hearing live music, particularly called free jazz, new jazz, avant-garde jazz, or just the music. And I had the good fortune to start collaborating with a number of these musicians. I want to go back to say a lot of what I ha happened for me as I developed my career was spurred on by my experience by my experiences at Ohio State. We had two guest artists at OSU, Bill Dixon and Judith Dunn. She was a dancer, he a musician, and he was in that world of that type of music I started following because of his music. And they had that dance music connection. I said, oh, I like that. So I just went that direction and I developed my own company called Sounds in Motion. And from the company, we had live music. We had some improvisational connections that we did with the music. And I did a lot of work that was based on the experiences of African-American peoples. I had my own studio, which was on 125th and Lenox in the heart of Harlem. Besides our rehearsals and the classes we had there, I also mentored other choreographers, dance artists, and I also produced them in my studio. I don't know, that just tickled me that I could help other people make their dance or theater or poetry. I liked uh, all of the arts, the visual arts. We did all of that in the studio. And at the same time, Sounds in Motion toured around the world and in our own neighborhood. And I continued that tradition over time with other companies that I've developed throughout the years. I also uh, was invited to choreograph for theater. So since the middle 1970s, I've been choreographing theater productions um, throughout the United States, also in London. I did theater production, a theater production in London. I've also choreographed work for Broadway. And because I was so jealous of theater, because of the way they're totally supported, as when you're the head of your dance company, you kind of do everything. In theater, people were taken care of. <laughs> but anyway, I started developing my own dance-driven dramas, dance-driven dramas, which means that I interview people around a certain subject, and then I create a theater work, theater dance work that um, has been, that those works have been produced in theater venues. So I cross and I also do some work in film. So my work and in opera, as uh, Allison mentioned. So through, I'm going to tell you that through my experience of the Ohio State University, I had the confidence to move forward and also had the tools to move forward with moving into these particular areas. My main area is, of course, I, I shouldn't say, but the concert dance. Coming up into the day, I have a new work I'm developing called Speaking in the Same Tongue through a grant I have through New York Foundation for the Arts uh, and National Dance Project. A new film came out that I created a it came out last month called Hal King. And also two books came out recently that tell my process. Wendy Perrins, The Grand Union, and Dance We Do by Intezaki Shange, my good friend and collaborator. Dance We Do, A Poet Explores Black Dance. 
So now I'm gonna show you a few photos like Abby did. I'm trying to speak not to, I'm trying to speak quickly so I don't take up too much time. You all can fill in my blanks by asking me questions. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you Sue. This is a photo of one of my mentors, Vera Blaine. We call her, oh, I hope everybody can see it. Vera Blaine, named Vic, oh, thanks Abby. On this particular concert, Abby's work was on this concert too. But Vera Blaine, over the years, I asked her to come and view my work so she could give me feedback. I was a guest artist for a few weeks there at OSU and I asked her to come in, see the work I was working on and give me notes, which of course she never held back any notes. She's gonna tell you like it is. I also asked, asked Vicki Blaine to help me. She came to New York to watch some of my work and give me feedback. A long time experience. I'm telling you what she told me when these dancers were dancing in the piece, this is the piece we did at OSU called Voice of the Blues. One of the young ladies named Maddie, she's done work with me in New York. <laughs> so I keep up with people. I want you to know, I keep up with dancers. These two, th this piece was at OSU. The, the uh, feedback she gave me were two things. She said, give us more surprises in your choreography. And number two was the dancers are dancing like white people. So make them dance like you want. Okay. <laughs> they laughed. No, they didn't laugh when she said that because she was serious. All right. This is a, one of my, some of my company members in 100% Cotton. This was back in the 80s, and this was uh, music by Oliver Lake. We worked with many musicians, some very well now known nationally, internationally. This is a, a, at a concert I had in my studio. And this is from a piece called, that's me. This is from a piece we did called The Coming of Eagles. It was the first time I did a piece a concert of my own work in the studio. Usually I produce other people in the studio, but this was a joy to do this. Usually we're at the Joyce or at BAM, something like that. Okay. This piece is called How Long Brethren. I had the good fortune in 1990 to reconstruct a work of a dance pioneer, Helen Tamiris. Helen Tamiris sometimes worked with music concepts and history of African-American peoples, even though that was not her own background. She was given some music that were lyrics of music and lyrics of workers, black workers, laborers in the South in the 1920s. And she developed a piece called How Long Brethren. So over the years, I, it was not easy to uh, reconstruct this piece. There were no notes from her. There was all the original music and a lot of photos. And I found the four women who were in the original piece. So when I've done this work on a professional company, Cleo Parker Robinson's company, it's been done on about four or five university companies. These young people, when they are doing this, and at American Dance Festival, probably four times, when they do this work or when they do any of my work that is rising up from the African-American experience, the dancers themselves become, become that. They are not pretending to move like people from that er early era or from people who had that experience of being so oppressed. oppressed. They become that. I insist on that. That's when Vicki Blaine said, oh, you all are moving like white people. She wanted me to insist that they move like I had in mind. When we do How Long Brethren on these different groups around the country, they experience that history. They become sh changed from their, 
from those ancestors who are speaking to them. This is a piece called Open the Door of Virginia, one of my dance-driven dramas. It's about a civil rights experience in Virginia in 1951. A young lady named Barbara Rose Johns decided she was going to have her whole black school go on strike to get better, a better school. Her work became, her actions became part of Brown versus Board of Education. And we did a whole piece around this. And now they're going to put a statue up of her in the US Capitol where they took down a statue of Robert E. Lee. I did another dance driven drama about my father called I Could Stop on a Dime and Get 10 Cents Change. These were um, professional, professional actor, dancer, singers. Olu Dara, my associate, did the music. Here's a rehearsal at Barishnikov Art Center for speaking in the same tongue. That's my back, I guess you got that. This is a work we did at New York Live Arts a few years ago. It was in tribute to James Baldwin. That's me, New York Live Arts with Y Music, music by Marcos Balter. That's me. I guess you know which one I am. <laughs> Back from 1965 or 66 at OSU in Doris Humphreys, Pasacalia and Fugue with my friend, Pamela Light Sharney. She sent me these pictures yesterday from Israel. Pam and her husband, Dan, have been lifelong friends of mine. We met, of course, at OSU. And that's another picture from OSU, 1965 or 66, in Doris Humphrey's Brandenburg Concerto. So those are what I wanted to share with you today. I, I hope I didn't go over time. That's it. I know I forgot some things, but okay. How was that, Abby? You're great. I mean, okay. you could go on. It was awesome seeing those pictures. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I'm up now. I think yeah. that's my cue. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just such I just need to pause for a moment. I think I know that we can't see all of the participants. There are many people out there, but I think we should all just pause to just sit with, you know, uh, so much that you've given us, such rich um, history, experience, aesthetics, ideas about um, art and the life of an artist. And um, so I'm just taking a moment for myself. Um, so, uh, uh, so I'm honored and, um, I also want to speak on behalf of the, um, OSU Department of Dance, even though I wasn't here, as you say, back in the day, <laughs> Diane, um, I'm just going to go ahead and boldly, um, be proud of both of you, uh, on behalf of the department, because you know, it's it's such a um, it's such an honor to on this occasion both the creative pathfinders, but also um, the occasion of both of you getting the 2020 USA Fellow Award. Um, it's just such um, and if I may say of two different generations, I think that's okay to say, right? Um, <laughs> that, that's, that this is just a beautiful moment and I'm very inspired um, uh, personally. Um, so, you know, we're just gonna go ahead and, uh, you know, we're on behalf of OSU Department of Dance, we're just gonna go ahead and pat ourselves on the back for being <laughs> a part, some part of your, of your journey. So congratulations to both of you. Um, and, um, I, as the moderator, I get the honor of asking the first question <laughs> and um, folks out in the audience, if you want to ask a question of either Diane or Abby, go ahead and put it in the, um, in the Q&A and I will get to it um, and ask on your behalf. Um, so <laughs> one of my big takeaways though, a uh, little tongue in cheek, 
is about the important role of New Jersey for you, Abby. So I'm also a Jersey girl, if folks don't know. Um, you know, Central Jersey, but it still counts. It still counts. So I'm just gonna say that out loud. That's, yeah, you know, Jersey's in the house. Um, and I'm also thinking about how you both beautifully disrespect boundaries around genre and around perhaps what somebody, somebody says we're supposed to be doing as dancers, as makers, as choreographers. So I wanna honor that. So I'm thinking about that, crossing boundaries. Mainly though, I'm thinking about um, how you're both touching on this idea of necessity and um, uh, Abby, you talk about necessity. Diane, you talk about dance that is vital. And um, what popped into my head was um, a piece by Audre Lorde, which uh, the title of that piece was Poetry is Not a Luxury. And I think um, what I'm hearing is for both of you, dance is not a luxury, right? Dance is vital. It's, it's necessary. It's what we have to do. It's what we, it's what we do. We are art artists all the time not just when we get the commission or the grant or, right? This is what we do all the time. Um, of course, it's, you know, a luxury in one sense, but it's also, I think, important that both of you are speaking to the stakes of dance, right? What's at stake for both of you? So I want us to think about that. Um, Diane, you talk about being an activist. Um, I'm also seeing a connection between both of you and these ideas and the importance of um, the African diaspora aesthetics for both of you um, and um, the influence of artists that you work with um, and how you operate as collaborators. So I'm wondering about this necessity, this vitality but also I ask very complicated questions. So run with me, this is how my brain works. So I'm also wondering how we respect, honor, recognize that vitality, that necessity that might um, look different for different people, um, either your collaborators or audience members. So how do you, can you talk about how are you responsible for aesthetic stakes for all the people you work with and um, the people you're bringing together? I'm hearing something that, you know, when you say, Diane, you know, um, you know, you know, you can't do this half heartedly. You can't do this without embodying what it means to do this work. Right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you can't, you know, sort of cite the struggle, right? You can't you can't put quotation marks around what's underneath, um, what's at stake behind the movement. You have to do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so how do you how do you honor that? Work with it. Insist upon it. Um, be responsible to it, right? Abby, you're working in aesthetics sometimes that are not necessarily your own, you know. Um, uh, culturally from your, you know, your um, upbringing? How do you, how do you um, attend to those um, stakes and responsive and uh, necessities? And then to make things even more complicated, <laughs> how does that operate now, you know, this crazy year? Right, when all of that is heightened, everything is heightened. So you don't have to talk about and, you know, and pandemics, but you know, though that's where my head is going. So, you know, there are questions in there, but maybe that's, um, that's fruitful. Oh, yeah. Diane, do you wanna go? Do you want me to say something? <laughs> oh, okay, well, I'll try. I'll, I'll just say a couple of things. One thing you hit upon there, Nadine, um, one of my dear friends who's passed away now, Ntozaki Shange, she wrote an article years ago about my work and she said, the people, the dancers dance as if, as if, if they don't do this movement, they might just die. Yeah. 
podcast. When when she said that, I'm like, yes, that's the way that's the way it is. It was like they did. It was like arduous. She said it's arduous. It's something about it's ar- It's not like the movement was hard. It was like arduous. So my only thing I can say is that the way to ensure that not that you're thinking about that as you go from day to day is that the people you work with that you have those same values the dancers the musicians because I, I i work i didn't emphasize that but that's part of my thing that i work a lot with with the musicians and uh they have to be coming from the same place just like abby said some people can't get with what you're doing and then you don't know that sometimes at first. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you might know from another kind of collaborator because you may have seen their work over time. Even if you don't know them personally, you know they have that. Uh, it, it's commitment beyond commitment. But sometimes if you have a dancer or you call collaborator, um, Abby, or some person that is some type of, sometimes they don't, <laughs> they're not coming from that same place. And then you 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 have to separate part ways. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, Abby? Mm-hmm. Go on. And sometimes it takes, I mean, it takes time to recognize that. Because yes. um, I know that I, I'm coming from a very specific background that other white, cis, you know, gender female dancers are not coming, like we're not seeing eye to eye. We don't consider dance. It doesn't have the same meaning in our lives, in our community, in how we understand the world. And so it's actually more interesting that th- that friction comes up more often when I'm working with people who identify more like me than when I'm working with people where there's a heightened sort of sense of like difference in identity because there's more there's more consideration. And I'm actually really interested in that, that aspect of that friction that there are so many dimensions to, you know, how we all understand things according to maybe more invisible layers of identity. And Mm. that's actually where a lot of the complexity and like, um, that's where, that's where sort of evolution and really like creating a more just, uh dance field that's where it stops often because we think we're speaking the same language and we're not um so like for me you know white culture has always been appropriating at black aesthetics asian american asian aesthetic like like non non-western aesthetics in a very surface way for a very long time um i I'm not interested in a surface appropriation of anything. What I'm interested in is, is again, like the process and the psychology and the functionality and, and my own experience of like, oh, I have more in common training under Vincent Manso, who is telling me to eat the dirt in this classroom than I do when I'm, you know, trying to take a ballet class and someone is completely overlooking me because I've never been in one before and they think I'm hopeless. So like there was more like life, like, like life force in common with me throwing, you know, the bowling balls across the the, the lanes um, and, and sort of being in that sense of like the body and brain than there was to this kind of very shaped, cleaned up, stylized way of being um, that, that, doesn't necess- that doesn't represent me, I understand. So, so for me, like you say, how, how do I deal with that? Like, what are the ethics of that? And I think like collective digestion is really imperative. Like when talking with, with my collaborators and it's, it's super complex. And Momar and Jai, he's, a, he's an assistant professor. He, he works as a, a dramaturg, he's my partner. And he, he says this thing brilliantly. He's like, everything is more than one thing. And, and that is like something to really, like there's so much complexity and dimension that I want, I want to, I want to show the mess. Um, and, and then how can that be an entry point into a conversation that can kind of make some movement and, and, and some inroads into more understanding? 
Wow, great. <laughs> it's breathless and it's heady and it's important. And I hear all of that. Um, and thank you both for attending to, I think, you know, the complexities of that, as you say, it's, it's complex. And, um, um, you know, what you say, uh, show the mess, you know, I think that's really important. And when you say, Diane, you know, um, you know, our lives depend upon it, right? Um, so I'm gonna be a good moderator now and, um, and field some of these questions um, from, um, from uh, participants. Um, and this one comes from um, Kylie Smith and it says, Abby, exclamation point. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Can you share more about the reality of managing and producing work with your company in a field today while also being on faculty at an institution, not just in COVID times, but more broadly in the changing landscape of dance, of the dance field in this current time? Mm. Hi, Kylie. I, I, I taught Kylie when she was a freshman, I, when I was teaching freshman technique <laughs> before, before I left for University of Illinois. Um, it is both impossible and necessary <laughs> to, to, to work full time as a professor and have a working company. Uh, because in the beginning, I relied on the university for funding because I didn't live in New York and I, I wasn't part of a, I wasn't using a familiar language or a language that was speaking to grants or presenters in a way um, that, that in academia, it, 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 people were, I think because of the way I'm making my language accessible uh, about what it is I'm doing and it's not just dance related, that there was an interest in, in helping support and fund that because it's a research one institution. So it is, it was completely necessary. I wouldn't have, if I didn't have that, I wouldn't have had any support. But it, I also ran myself into the ground, um, driving to Chicago every weekend to fly to New York City to work on the weekends, to fly back, to drive back down to Champaign, to do the whole thing again the next weekend. So COVID has really shifted that and I'm really reevaluating. But it's a, it, a, I don't know. I think a lot of things are changing. Like uh, my work, I'm using this time and I know probably Diane is, I mean, everyone is like, what, what can we let go of and still maintain the integrity and the ethos of the work considering everything that we're up against right now? Um, so I'm in the process of reevaluating, sort of creating more sustainable, like mental, physical um, systems to keep the work going. It's not easy, but it seems like a necessary Mm. evil but I say it with a smile because it's like we all need to work and I love teaching but it is very time consuming I'm going to combine um, perhaps these two questions that are um, they seem a, a bit similar um, and it's for both of you so maybe Diane you can speak first on this one um, one of the the questions um, was about um, what do you think the top three skills um, that a dance student needs to learn that not only make them um, a good artist, but also a good citizen? And that's combined with a question um, from um, Sarah Wookie that says, this is great, exclamation point. Mm -hmm. So wonderful to hear from alum, proud to be among you. I am curious what either of the speakers feel are the top three transferable skills of train, or like top three, it's about top three, <laughs> transferable skills of trained dancers that might be of service to our time in which we are confronted by various humanitarian crises and especially the need to support a return to socialization of being together again in time and space, which is what dance seems to understand how to do. Um, and Sarah says, I hope that is clear. Um, and, you know, after my own heart with the deep, complicated questions for uh, the last 10 minutes. So, Diane, maybe um, if you can speak to it first. Okay, so the trained skills of a dancer in this time. Okay, uh, one thing that I think a uh, that's very important for a trained dancer during any time 
is absorb all that you can in all different various techniques. Even if you are in some, uh, some kind of class that's like, that is not really my thing. Why do I have to learn this? Why are they making me go through this to get a degree? Okay, <laughs> okay. You have to find, don't, don't, don't hold back. Put your whole self inside of that something in it is going to come up for you that's necessary. Okay, that's that's one thing. I say that because sometimes I've had students in class that do like this. Mm -hmm. They got, it's like, oh, she's doing this stuff. What, what is that? Okay, they go like this. Okay, so, so just absorb yourself totally inside of whatever. Also, you have to read, read, read. I, I think that can be part of uh, the whatever the people have to uh, uh, put inside their training, the teachers. You have to read, read, be absorbed in what it is that happening now in your current events, in all parts of the culture, in places in different parts of the world. Let that be part of your dance training. Maybe the beginning of classes, you talk about that or the beginning of rehearsals. It's just like, what's our topic for today? Oh, I hear that so-and-so is happening and da-da-da-da-da. This informs you as a human being, as a human being to know what the world is. So those are my two. I didn't get the three. <laughs> <laughs> I think I share, maybe I have a little different wordage, but I think okay. I share a lot of those, those same qualities. And I think it's like both, you know, something like adaptability and openness are, they're, they're, they're both, there's physical manifestations of that, but it's also kind of psychological, like staying active in a classroom. I mean, I know it's the old school thing, but like, if you're bored, you're, you're doing something wrong. Like there's, there is, um, the world wasn't made for you. I think I'm very conditioned. And I think a lot of people in dance settings in particular, I'm conditioned by being other, which is odd for white, a white person to have experienced that. Like it's not super common, but I think it's like understanding what's happening around you because you're not just learning what's happening in the classroom, but you're also being conditioned by like what's happening between people in the classroom, how the space is set up. Like, so, so being observant and, and absor absorbing, taking in as much information as possible, but knowing it's not just about you, you know, rote repetition in your body and getting stronger, but there's so many layers that are being trained or being conditioned or being activated when you're in a class or a rehearsal or playing, you know, whatever. Um, and this sense of staying humble. Uh, and that's like both don't beat yourself up because realize that the, the end, like the finish line, you can't see the finish line. Like if you're in our, I, I think Diane agrees with me. It's like, you don't know what the, the end of this is. Mm -hmm. Like, like you don't want to contain, you don't want to put limits on yourself. Um, and so that's really exhausting. So I think right now there is like a need to talk a little bit about the like, what's the mental side of continuing to go if you're gonna put your body kind of in these like rigorous physical situations, if you're gonna be a dancer. I think now it's like people are actually starting about to talk about mental health and dance in ways where it really was not, I know like undergrads that the BA students at U of I, everybody's like, double majoring in psychology and dance because they're like, there's something in here that I need to know. So I don't know if I numbered it out either. We kind of yeah, made that, three by talking to each other. Yeah, I think number three is that don't beat yourself up. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. You have to be kind to yourself as you're going through the training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And forgive yourself for not getting to number three because it wasn't a rule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was number three. Yeah, that was number three. So, you know, I'm very sad that, you know, this, you know, the wisdom of this um, conversation is only an hour because I feel like we could talk forever. And, you know, I, there's so much more, but I have one, you know, if you can be very quick, because I, I have to throw this back to the conveners in time. So this, uh, you know, rapid response. Um, and uh, the question is, you know, are there some things, what are some things that you do personally 
um, in addition to your work that help you with that spiritual wellness? Maybe, maybe touching on what you were just saying about being kind to yourself. Um, what is one thing that you do to, um, to take care of yourself, especially, you know, especially at a moment like this? Mm. Okay, well, I'll say, um, well, for many years, I have been a meditator. So I, I meditate. And uh, through all, all the years and through this particular period, it's been uh, a, a support beyond what I can even uh, say. And the other thing is sometimes when I'm feeling not so upbeat, I do something for somebody else. And in this, so that means now I would call somebody or <laughs> I won't go see that, but somebody that needs, that I feel, and then for some reason that really, it, it just, uh, it, it really picks me up. So those are two things that I would mention since I would mention quickly. <laughs> Thank you, beautiful. Have you got a quick one for us? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, I'm somebody like, I know I'm very prone to being depressed and especially when dance as I knew it was taken away, you know, I, I have relied on the, the endorphin rush of the physicality to keep me up in my life. That's another sort of element of necessity that it's played for me. So reminding myself or having others around me remind me to like get back in my body and take on little tasks, whether it's, do the dishes. Why do you keep putting the dishes off? Like get into your body and just accomplish this thing. You could put like move, move bricks from one side of the room to the other or something, but actually just reminding myself to like not neglect, you know, that, that these other parts of, of my moving body can do something similar to what dance has held, you know, in a specific place when we're allowed to gather and operate in the same way. So getting back into the body um, has been necessary. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I should say that was a question from Carrie Ann. Um, uh, and, you know, I just want to thank you both. I know that Allison will in a second, but personally, I want to thank you both um, for, you know, a conversation that was both um, inspiring on the grand scale, but also in that really honest, um, I think, everyday advice, especially for our students, because we're all trying to figure out how to take care of ourselves and each other and to be artists that who are um, um, helping to um, helping to do the right thing by the world these days, because, you know, I believe you, I'm right there with you that the stakes are high for all of us and that we play an important part in all of this. I did a terrible job. I was supposed to end two minutes ago, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be unapologetic about it and now throw it back over to Allison, who's our convener for the um, Creative Pathfinder series. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Nadine. At the top of the hour, a statement of land acknowledgement was telegraphed to you. I would invite you to learn more about this complex history and some of the steps that you can take to shift from a stance of acknowledgement to one of action by visiting the link to Ohio State's Multicultural Center that we just put in the chat box. I'd like to extend my sincere gratitude to and thanks to Abby, Diane, and, and Nadine for this heartfelt and inspiring conversation. This is the final episode in the 2021 Creative Pathfinders webinar series. Please stay tuned for future programming and events through the Barnett Center for Integrative Arts and Enterprise. Thank you so much.